is now. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We'd just like to make a start to this session. Um, we're looking at some of the enabling factors and barriers to computer science education. And we'll start off with some discussions here, but actually we'd very much welcome your view. And my hope for, when I suggested this session, my, my hope was that we'd create some useful links between us all so that over the course of the next few days, we can have further discussions and have um, you know, in-depth sessions um, in the break times between the main <coughs> conference, because that's usually quite a valuable time to network. Okay, so we're going to begin. We've got some questions that I've asked the panelists, but I'm just going to, first of all, let them introduce themselves. Every person here has come from <coughs> a different area or got a different part of the story for CS education, whether that's primary, secondary, or HE. So if I start, maybe down with... Hi, I'm, I'm Genevieve. I teach computer science at FE College, which is A-level, but I've also <coughs> done outreach with grade two students, and I do kind of lots of hack events to enable students to take away the fear of computer science. Okay, I'm Frank. Uh, I'm a primary teacher here in Barcelona, and I've been using uh, Scratch as a way to introduce computer science in school since uh, the early beginning, and I'm happy to be here just listening to the other panelists. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Claire McInerney. I work in Lero, which is the Irish Software Engineering Research Centre, and I'm based at the University of Limerick. Um, I'm the Education and Outreach Officer there, so um, I'm doing a lot of work with schools to um, get programming and computer science into schools and started using Scratch about five years ago. And um, we don't have any official computer science on our curriculums in schools yet in Ireland, so it's all optional, but it's coming shortly, and we're very excited about it. <laughs> I am uh, Peter Donaldson, and I'm a head of department up in Scotland in a, a lovely bunny wee place called uh, Creef, uh, Creef High School. I'm also uh, one of the board for CAS Scotland, which is uh, Computing at School Scotland, and I'm involved with the National CPD uh, project, which should be starting just after the, the summer holidays and then continuing on for the next uh, two years. Hi, and I'm Claire Ox from the University of Warwick. Um, I teach robotics uh, at that university, but I also manage the outreach program for the department. And that includes doing activities for students and for teachers, uh, supporting them in delivering computer science uh, activities. I realised I haven't introduced myself. I'm Margaret Lowe. Um, I'm a member of staff at the University of Warwick. I'm a computer scientist. I've spent a lot of time working on commercial projects. But one of my interests and hobbies, if you like, on a voluntary basis, has been working with the local schools and local teachers to support computer science activities. Um, so that. It, and it, I've been doing so much of it, the department have now made it a little bit of my job to do it as well, <laughs> which is quite nice. Um, okay, so if we can get started. What's the first sort of question that I wanted us to think about was, what do we feel about is one of the main barriers in our area that where we work? What, are the, what is the, one of the main barriers to computer science, um, the teaching of computer science? Uh, sorry, Genevieve, what? shall I start at this then? Yeah. No, 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 no and the ability to learn something without having the pressure of going, okay, I was on a course yesterday, how do I then translate that into my classroom tomorrow morning, which is kind of what they want. So I'd say really it's the CPD challenge, um, which is continual professional development in the, in the UK. But that would say, the, for me, that's the biggest challenge 
along with a whole bucket load of other challenges. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll leave the panel to choose those. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think one of the barriers is that people feel like um, computer science is difficult, mm -hmm. and that's it. It's difficult, so I will not try it. Uh, only if you're a geek uh, of the Big Bang Theory thing, uh, you can program a computer or use a robot. So, well, I, I think one, teacher training is also a problem. Because teachers, uh, they get scared, um, well, we, get, uh, myself, uh, of new things, learning new things. Uh, we prefer our, have our classroom closed, and just we are one teacher, 25 students, and they can manage the situation. If you start doing scratch in your classrooms, you can see that it's like chaotic, like um, there's a lot of noise. So, um, and you don't have only one problem. That's, for me, it's one of the important barriers is that when you're doing computer science, there's not one solution. So some teachers want to have a problem that has only one solution, so it's easy. When you're doing a scratch, you have, uh, if you've got 25 students, you have 25 different problems and 25 different solutions. That's fun, that's a good thing. But some people, I think, that they, get, they get scared about it. Okay, so um, I suppose the big barrier to computer science education in Ireland is that, um, well, we don't really have computer science education <laughs> in our schools. Um, so up to this point, it's been mostly um, ICT and the use of um, technology in the schools. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're now moving towards um, big reform in our um, secondary schools. So they're introducing these things called short courses. Um, these are 100-hour courses that will take from one to three years. And um, we've been asked to write um, one of those short courses on programming and coding. So I suppose one of the first barriers we have is we've been fighting over this title. I want it called computer science, and it's called programming and coding. So that's a biggie. Um, so then I suppose once the, the rollout for this is scheduled in September 2014, so I suppose once we get to that point, then you have all the other types of barriers that people are talking about here. Like, you know, how do we train up our teachers that are in training? Um, how do we train up the teachers that are already out there? But I, um, so, yeah, so I suppose um, there would be the problems. Yeah. They would be the barriers. Um, for us, the, 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 the barriers that um, we found, uh, one of the major um, problems is actually redefining what it means to, to do computer science at, in high school. So in the past, what's happened is that because text-based languages were, were you know, pretty much the, the way that you learn to program, um, teachers, in order to make it manageable for themselves, uh, gradually simplified and simplified and, and simplified. And I think, to a certain extent, they simplified too much. And what we lost was we lost the, the magic of computer science. We lost the, 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 the creative nature of it as a medium of expression. Um, so it's not just enough to learn how to program and, and what the different concepts mean. You want to have something that you can create, that you can share with other people. So the social aspect, I think, is, is really important. You know, you want pupils to go back home and say to their parents, Mum, I went and I, I created this interactive card, or I made this game, do you want to play this game with me? Or uh, I made this cool simulation, look what happens when you, you, you move the match over the bit of wood, it comes on fire and then when you touch the rope it, it uh, goes along and it creates an explosion. Things that, that people can actually share with someone else to try and um, get over to them how uh, magical a, 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 an area computer science can be. That's the main challenge. I mean, I, I think being the, the kind of fifth person to answer, quite a lot's already been said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suppose what I've got down here is a kind of summary of all of those things. And for me, that, that major barrier is a kind of computer science as an image problem, or there's a kind of lack of knowledge about what computer science is. And so we have teachers who are perhaps very concerned about being able to deliver the new curriculum and what, what's in there, because there's perhaps a little bit of a, a being frightened or a little bit scared of, of what that, that curriculum is. And, um, and then you, you've got a senior management team, perhaps in schools, who just don't understand the scale of the change between what has been taught and what's about to be taught, and therefore the space and the effort and the resource they need to put towards giving teachers that opportunity to, to get themselves uh, up to speed with it. 
Um, and then also that same image problem or that same lack of understanding about what computer science is is also what, what might put off some of the some of, of the students from, from taking that as a qualification later. So um, I suppose that encapsulates a lot of what has been said already on the panel um, uh, in, in one way or another. Is it useful now to ask, has anybody else got any barrier that we'd like to share with the panel at this point? No? So do you think it's, so you're feeling a synergy between what we're saying here? Yeah. <laughs> the pain. <laughs> thank you, thank you. what everyone has said, but um, I know that where I'm from in Oklahoma, basically curriculum is keyboarding and Microsoft Office, and then in their final year before college when they're 18, all of a sudden there's AP computer science that you can get college credit for, and there's no in-between. And so basically if you weren't already a hobbyist, you were screwed. I know our recent test scores there nationally the majority of people either got a one, which is the lowest, or they got a five. There was very little in between, so we need to, to make up that gap. Anybody else? In Israel, the situation, I think, is better because the teachers of computer science are trained, and trained and with lots of courses of development and uh, this is some kind of a burden to the teachers but uh, <laughs> yeah, the, on the other side but the teachers are well trained and they have the pedagogical content knowledge that is needed as well as the content knowledge so in our case, it's good. And I think that if I understood you well, in Ireland, it would be good. <laughs> because you're starting from scratch. <laughs> yes, it actually is my so you can <laughs> <laughs> So you can do that. And in Israel, uh, now they are doing some kind of um, encouraging students to, su to study uh, science. So the, it is obligatory to study computer science at the grade for these students who are chosen to be studying this technology and uh, science, it's obligatory to study computer science and mm -hmm. physics. Oh, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. So, so we've listed a whole lot of barriers, if you like. Um, we'll pick this up towards the end, so we're not going to finish just complaining about all the barriers, <laughs> <laughs> which is not a good place to start. Um, you know, in terms of my own perspective, I felt in the UK, um, I'm, I, work in, I work in higher education, and I felt quite sad when I realised what was happening and being taught in schools. And that's why I personally made a decision to do a lot more work in terms of outreach and activities. And we've been very fortunate, I think, in, in the UK in that there's been a grassroots movement called Computing at Schools. Um, and several people here are active members. And that's been very valuable in pulling us... We've had these little pools of people doing things, but it's given us a channel to all work together and expand. So, anyway... We'll go on with the next question. Maybe I should start at the other end this time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right, so, so we've looked at barriers. Um, what are, do we think, an enabling factor to computer science activities in school? So are enabling factors? So clear if you like. So, so I kind of um, chose to kind of look at this in a kind of what are the opportunities for universities to help um, or get involved? Um, and underneath this computing at school network that Margaret mentioned, there's something called the Network of Excellence. And that Network of Excellence is a kind of collection of universities in the UK who've kind of come together and said, 
we want to help. We, we, you know, we, we have a subject knowledge, whether that's in computer science or in, in many cases in our education departments as well. Um, and you know, we, we want to get involved. And, and the universities have been doing a number of different things. Um, they have been uh, running CPD programs um, and uh, uh, hopefully a lower cost than some of the, 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 the bigger programs w w which are, are kind of pricing teachers uh, out of them. Um, there's a kind of the, many universities have ambassador programs or volunteer programs like Mar Margaret's Warwick Volunteers, um, which are running, which uh, are kind of good at addressing some of that um, uh, th th those image problems. Um, the, you know, the, there's an opportunity there for, for mentoring local teachers, uh, local to the university, and, and lots of universities have been getting involved in that. Um, and also, I think universities have a little bit of clout. Um, so uh, in our region, we've, we've kind of come together as three universities, University of Birmingham, Coventry University, and University of Warwick, to approach head teachers and senior management teams in the region. And I think we have a little bit of clout when we go to them and say, we'd like to tell you about what's happening in computing at schools and, uh, and see if, if, if that, you know, th try and make them more aware of some of those challenges uh, that are out there. And I just kind of want to conclude w what I'm saying is, is you know, universities aren't just doing that because we're, it's full of kind of warm, fuzzy, loving, wonderful people. Um, it's good for the university too. Do you know where um, it, it's a great experience? I'm sure if you speak to any of the the, the guys on the front here, who are, who are uh, the Warwick volunteers, the technology volunteers that, that that are here with Margaret, they'll tell you what a wonderful experience it, it is to to go out and and kind of support teachers. And you know, it's the same for our staff and students who get involved. So you know, and it raises our profile and it helps build relationships with teachers. So I think there's a real win-win there um, for universities in getting involved in helping uh, teachers kind of face what's happening in computer science. I think one of the, the really exciting things uh, for for us is the wealth of. And different environments that you can use for introductory, but also to tackle some of the more um, challenging ideas in a really accessible way. Um, I was just in uh, Stephen Howell's uh, Scratch to Connect uh, session, and, and it was fantastic. There you've got a, a hardware device that's tracking uh, different parts of your body, and yet you're able to write a fairly short program to take that information and to do something with it. I mean, it's a, an embarrassment of, uh, of riches that we have at the, at the moment. And really, it's just a case of thinking carefully about the kinds of activities and experiences that we want to do with the pupils. And to remember that, you know, if we teach computer science in a, in a sort of more social context, I think that a lot more people will engage much more deeply and will we'll actually have a much stronger sort of perception of, about the field. Um, certainly, uh, from my point of view, some of the most sort of productive things that I've done uh, personally with teaching have been getting together with uh, one of my friends and just hacking, you know, creating some programs to do something interesting and just spending some time batting ideas back and forward. And I think if we can have more of those kind of experiences, I think that that will be a, a real enabling factor um, to pull more people into at least experience in the basics of, uh, of computer science and, and um, what it can do for them. Okay, so um, the enabling factor is in Ireland. So we don't have um, a, a big organisation like CAS, but we have a Computer Education Society of Ireland. Um, John is over there um, if you want to talk to him. But I suppose that would be our equivalent. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd have that organisation. And the other thing about Ireland, it's a really small place. There's only four million of us. <laughs> <laughs> everybody kind of knows everybody. So, like, all the Irish people that are here at the conference know what we're all doing in terms of kind of scratch and outreach. And so we do all talk to each other quite a lot. It may not be sort of as formal, um, but, you know, we, we tend to, you know, we do have things going on around the country. So I suppose we do have a nice network gradually building up. Um, and I suppose um, the other thing that's um, sort of in our favour at the moment, and I don't know if I should mention this or not, but the whole IT careers, like Ireland is in a big res bad recession at the moment and parents are looking to, well, what can my kids do that where they might have some chance of getting jobs? And there's actually some jobs in IT in Ireland and there aren't jobs really in um, many other things at the moment. So we do have parents going into school saying, I want my kids to learn this stuff like I don't you know fine if they do the kind of the ECDL and the word processing but there are there, there's a lot of parents now 
who are behind this sort of getting computer science into schools, which helps you know, convince the, the principals or whatever to, to take it further. Um, and then I suppose, as you mentioned, as this lady here mentioned, for us, it is a brand new subject area. So we don't have the sort of, we don't have the existing IT subject that we have to change. So we're sort of starting from scratch. And um, then I, I suppose the other thing as well is, like I've been running Scratch Outreach for about five years now, and we have a very large pool of really enthusiastic teachers that we know about that are you know, chomping at the bit to get going on this computer science stuff. So I think there's fantastic enthusiasm, even if there aren't the supports yet within the sort of formal educational um, systems and structures. So, so it's all great. Yeah. <laughs> you said everything. Well, so, uh, <laughs> no, I, I was thinking that maybe um, when we were talking that one of the barriers was um, teacher training. Uh, but I think that um, one enabling factor is that uh, if you get a network of teachers, as you did, um, here to, to build a, a community of teachers so uh, you don't feel alone when you're in your, in your class. Um, I showed in my Ignite presentation the way we are trying to do it. It's like having a mentor teacher with another teacher doing a scratch session, for example, and the next hour he's left alone, so he, he knows um, the problems that will occur, and he knows um, uh, what to do in case there is a problem. So I think that sometimes um, people, um, teachers, uh, feel kind of alone <laughs> when, when trying to do these kind of things. So help, it's not only teacher training, hey, You've got an online course, and that's it. No, they need, they need no, but, but sometimes it happens that teachers go to a workshop, they love it, but they go back to their schools and they're scared. So. And another thing is, um, maybe, I should say something wrong, but like maybe we should stop talking about saying the name computer science, because maybe it's also scary. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but uh, you talked about programming, coding, changing the world. Um, um, I don't really teach my students programming. I teach them creating things. So maybe it's part of the solution. I mean, sometimes people feel scared about words. Um, and if you change the words, may maybe they are more comfortable. And no. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Um, a kind of a similar thing to what Frank was saying about the actually having a kind of mentor teacher. Um, it's what I did with the primary school teachers. So they're grade two or second year infant school. Um, and I went and taught six weeks. So I didn't teach the teacher, I just taught the class. Mm -hmm. um, and they learnt alongside. Um, but one of the things that they did say is don't change any of the terminology. So I used algorithm, conditioned and lusted loops. They just did like Makaton signs and acted them out, which was great because then I learned some stuff that I'd never seen or used before. So I had my GCSE and A-level students running around acting like birds and stuff <laughs> like that. And it was just it, that kind of whole physical type of learning. And again, the communication, there's, I don't know if this is the same anywhere else, but in the UK, you're very much in your environmental bubble. So primary school teachers mm -hmm. stick to primary school. And then you have like this big chunk of secondary who don't talk to anybody. And then you have the rest of them. And this, this kind of disconnect. And I found that what they're doing at primary school is so much more advanced. And then they hit grade seven and we kind of regress them back into this child that can't think for themselves. Um, whereas they're very, very independent in primary school. And I wouldn't have been aware of that had I not gone in and taught these classes. Um, and that's kind of coming out a bit more, they're becoming much more confident, the primary schools, to take risks than the secondary schools. That's another issue, isn't it? Whether mm -hmm. you're prepared to take the risk or not. But yeah, okay. but yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Could we now ask you guys to, to what do you think is an enabling factor in CS education? Yeah, this is your opportunity. Come on. I think everybody wants to go home by the sound of it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, we must have some good points. No? Can I just add to, to a little bit? I, I think it's a really, really exciting time to be in the job that I'm in. Uh, and I guess a lot of people in this room also feel the same. I think the growing community of people and the growing com 
bunch of resources that there are out there and all of the different technologies that are coming just feels like a really something quite special is growing and it's it's quite fun to be involved. the perfect storm mm. i don't know if, if it is quite that but yeah tools especially i think there's so many introductory tools that can be used to teach computer science in a non-threatening way especially not having to start with text-based languages, but I do feel the need at some point for us to be thinking about the bridges mm -hmm. from visual block-based languages to uh, the more mature, higher order programming languages. The other thing, uh, well, coming to enabling factors, I feel we may want to explore the several online platforms available now. I'm not talking MOOCs per se, not <coughs> massive online courses, but, um, Someone earlier in a talk, I think it was Olaf, talked about how he created demo videos rather than demoing to the class and then having children watch the videos on their own and they're still in a social environment but being able to progress at their pace and go back to a, a demo video when they don't understand something because especially in programming, kids progress at very different levels and, and so leveraging technology to the extent we can with with videos and online learning and things yeah. like that too. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> you may can answer a question. No, no. Uh, go okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can say it in Spanish. That's a <laughs> Thank you very much for, for sharing your views with us. Um, I suppose the last question is, where we've seen, we've talked about the barriers, and now I suppose I want to look at how we've overcome some of the barriers we've faced, how we can, um, how others have overcome them, and is there any common strategies between us? Because I'm sure there are, although we each, when are different countries, and different education systems, I'm sure between this group of people there, are, there is commonality um, and we can get ideas from each other. So if, it, if um, I suppose I should start at this end again. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Jennifer. No, it's good. It's um, easier having the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where barriers have existed, how have you overcome? Um, it's a bit like the lady said, I use um, a lot of um, online support platforms for learning. Also my choice of language so I can kind of hit one language and multiple targets. So for example JavaScript because you can do a lot with that um, from gaming to web development and then it's one language that you actually look at the different problems, you deconstruct it but then you only, from my perspective it means I don't have to learn more than one language, even though I have to, because it depends what course you get given. <laughs> and then the um, other option is that the students can then go, well, I need this spe very specific bit. They can learn that for themselves. So platforms like um, Code Avengers, um, I probably prefer than, say, some of the others, um, because it's got monitoring tools attached to it, and it was specifically designed for the New Zealand computer science curriculum. So it's mapped to every point in the New Zealand curriculum. So from that perspective, you can actually see kind of where your students are at. You can also see like little blockers that they tend to sort of group together and have, so you can go over those and explain why. Um, and also using your students. I use my students all the time. They're so much better than me. It's like I don't. I really am not ashamed if I don't know something. That's totally fine in my classroom. It's fail fast, fail often as well. It's like break things. That's what you're there for. Um, so there's loads of students. They have a much more kind of narrow focus. They have time which teachers don't, you're marking, you've got kids, you've got, you know, your commute. Um, and so your students in your classroom are an amazing resource for you and they like it. They like sharing the fact that they're expert at something. And even if it's one little thing, it means that they can then be, you know, feel kind of proud for that day or whatever. Yeah. So, but that's my kind of, one of the things that I've used to overcome my lack of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, but then, I completely agree with you. When, when you give the power to the students, just like everything changes, no? So mm -hmm. it's uh, for me, it's one of the best, <laughs> one of the best options. And I think also that we have to be patient. I mean, changes changes take take a lot of time. I mean, five years ago, uh, this room, yes, five years ago, there was the first Scratch Day conference here, and we were only 20 teachers. Last year, it was more than 120. 
It took us five years to reach the number. So maybe if we wait five years more, <laughs> keep it working. <laughs> keep it, uh, maybe in, uh, in five years, we'll need another room. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. The Barca Stadium, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it is. I mean, sometimes we want to run too fast and changes take, take their time. And school is not special, it's not an institution that it's, uh, has its characteristic of being fast in changes. <laughs> so, yeah, let's wait and keep working. No? Um, yes, good point, Frank. Um, I agree with what you said about the time we'd have been in the same situation. Um, you know, when we started out the outreach program, we'd have only been dealing with a handful of teachers initially, and then it grew. Um, you know, to this like 120 or 150 teachers engaged now. Um, I suppose the other, um, the other sort of. Um, good thing that's happening is this general lobbying that's going on, you know, all this stuff on the news about the need for computer science, and that's really helping the case. Um, certainly, uh, you know, when you're in a country where there's a recession and the government are just looking at budgets and, um, you know, this very uh, money is, is tight. Um, I suppose one of the other things um, that we found useful is, um, again, a little bit on the sort of selling yourself, but uh, working with industry, we found that useful. Like we find if industry are endorsing what we're doing, it really helps for us to sell our case to the government and to sort of decision makers who are um, handing out funding. So, um, you know, that's another set of people that uh, I think is very useful to engage with because there's a, a lot of companies now that are becoming very socially active and you know, they have these programs where they want their employees to go out there and to be seen to be actively engaging in the community. And, um, you know, there's a lot of software companies out there. So um, I think that can really, tapping into that um, kind of maybe clo place that would be a little bit more behind closed doors before is, is a very useful um, uh, group to, to tap into to help you overcome maybe your scaling problems or maybe your knowledge problems. Um, um, so, yeah, that kind of sums up what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think for, for us, speaking just purely from a, a school perspective, one of the things that were really, was really useful was to actually get our, our senior management to come in. Come in, join a class, actually participate, um, take part, speak to the, to the pupils about what they're doing and, and why, and the problem-solving process that they've gone through when they've been making something in, in, uh, in my classroom. And that's really helped to kind of break down a lot of the, the um, perceptions, you know, about computer science. It's, it's just, you know, learning to use a computer um, or, you know, that, that pupils are inherently, you know, they're digital natives, so they can just magically, you know, <laughs> uh, think about how to do something and it will just immediately pop into their, their, their head without any kind of effort or any sort of prior experience on, on their part. So that's been really, really useful. Uh, I think definitely the more people uh, realise it's important to actually speak to others about what we do, why we think it's important, and to, to just share and, and celebrate an awful lot of the good stuff. Um, because there is an awful lot that's, that's, um, that's really fantastic and um, is worth talking to people about. And I think that's maybe something that, as a professional and, and as a sort of computing teacher, I haven't maybe done as much as I, as I could have done in the past. And I think that's something that, that really I want to try and continue to do more of. Even if it is only, you know, uh, 20 people in a, in a, in a room, uh, you know, trying to get your primary colleagues together to kind of maybe do an activity or talk about something, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's to kind of continue to talk to people, share what we do, and eventually you'll find that things begin to s gather pace, snowball, and you will get real change. But it, it does take time. It doesn't happen overnight, although it might seem so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, what's been critical is the partnership between our department and teachers that we've worked with. So we've run a number of training courses. Some have been one day long. Some have been over multiple sessions. We're about to move that to an online platform and start an, an, a, a MOOC in October for um, that, that, that's looking at kind of a, it's a course about learning computer science concepts, 
learning uh, programming and they're things that our department really does well but it's also a course about how do you teach that and that's you know how do you teach that in a school to school age students and that's not necessarily something that our department knows a lot about and um, we're a computer science department our students are all 18 plus um, so we've been working very closely with, with, with teachers to help us to develop that kind of content and that, that's worked brilliantly. You know, we can bring to that party you know, some of the really exciting things that are happening around data science or bioimaging or robotics or some really exciting kind of contexts and cultures and then we can work with people to turn that into something that's really, really good that it can go into schools and so it's that partnership I think that, that's been a, a kind of key success for us. Okay, thank you. This is your chance to, to participate and, and give us your thoughts about some of the barriers that you've faced and how you've overcome them. Yeah? Any volunteers? Well, we could be the teacher and pick you. Hey. <laughs> it's always good to start at the back. If people sit at the back, I always pick on them first. I'm Teresa from Portugal, and we are running a project that is doing for four years trying to get scratch into the schools. It's really slow, but what works best for us is to do some courses that are, we call it credited in the career of the teachers. Mm. So some of them, they do the courses not because they need the credits, because they are curious and they want, but the, the thing is, it's a practical course. So they have to do work with kids they inscribe, they have two sessions, five hours in Saturdays from 8.30 to, to 1.30, and then we launch them to kids, and they are scared completely, and we say, go cool, do what you, you know, only what you know, and let kids do the rest. So the third session is for them to tell us about the experiences. It's amazing. Kindergarten uh, educators, primary teachers, even secondary uh, and um, secondary teachers, they came amazed because what they did not know, the students uh, teach them, taught them. So uh, when they experiment, they believe. So it's very difficult, you were saying about workshops where people do workshops, we do them all the time, and then we get from 20 people, one or two that experiment, the impact is minimum. But when we do this, and kids show them the potential, not us, kids, they grow and they keep using it. So one of the ways to break the barriers is to make them see. If they don't see, they don't believe. So when we have some courses and teachers come with their sons, uh, I don't know what to do with him, bring him inside. So I be with their sons for just some minutes and one hour later, they are teaching the parents and all. <laughs> so they see the potential. The kids present some projects in the workshop that was for teachers, so they have to see. So whatever you do, show them kids working or experimenting or doing things that overcome what we expect from them. This is how uh, we are doing in, in Portugal. I, I would concur what you're saying because the volunteers that work, we work together, um, we run activities in teachers' classrooms so they can see it working for themselves. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Teresa. So as Margaret said, I'm um, one of the volunteers and I volunteer with Margaret under the technology volunteers. And I think this is it's been a really great opportunity for all of us for volunteering, but I think it's so beneficial for the teachers as well. And I was actually just interested to know, I know volunteering is quite popular in the UK, and I was interested to know whether in other countries, whether volunteering was something common and whether teachers have the opportunity to get volunteers into the school to assist them with, um, with their technology lessons, basically. In Israel, we have uh, volunteers coming to schools. Uh, usually, they are computer science uh, students that volunteer using Scratch or computer science for fun. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is very wonderful. They, they love it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else got anything to say about overcoming barriers or volunteers answering Sam's question on volunteers? Yeah, 
I think a good strategy could be to integrate computer science in, into the curriculum. So uh, is, uh, this morning, Mitch Resnick has said that um, uh, coding is like the, the, the children has to, to learn to code as uh, they learn to write. And uh, uh, you see that the, the children are, are learning to writing in all the subjects because they are, they are writing and the teachers of these subjects are, are helping them to learn to writing. And I think that computer science, we, we, we haven't to wait for, for a course uh, that is named computer science or coding. So we can put coding, we can put computer science into the art classes, into the science classes, into the maths classes, in do, on all of these, this, you know, all the, the subjects of the curriculum. It's what we try to do here in, in Catalonia. Thank you very much. It's nice to have a local picture. Anybody, anybody got any other things they'd like to share with us? I just wonder if the, that whole idea that you're talking about, is that if that is now being called sort of computational thinking, and is that, has it shifted towards that? So just, just I think it has. OK. Did you, did you really was Teresa, yeah. Sure. 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 <laughs> share, I like walking. Share with us. <laughs> <laughs> After share. yesterday. So uh, one thing is, uh, I am not exact. I, I do it voluntarily. I will do it and continue doing it. Uh, but my job is exactly to go to schools, not only do the workshops. So my main work is to go to schools and do exactly what you were saying, not as a volunteer, because this is my job, actually. So it, this works perfectly. Then about the computer science, or whatever we want to call it, yeah. in the <laughs> curriculum. Strangely, in Portugal, we, we are in a recession, so things are coming back. Not, the recession is not only about money, it's about ideas. So our government change, we have Ministry of Education that thinks that now what's best is to count and read and whatever, and uh, technology is not a priority. But strangely, they introduced an ICT classes uh, ICT, like this, uh, seven, they removed from other sides in seven and eight grades. And so our lobby was so strong that before we get there, we got to manage to put something called exploring computational environments. <laughs> and it's so smooth that it passed away. And before it went uh, out, they say it was optional. So if teachers wanted, they could do it. And then one day they phoned me and said, Teresa, we get it to be mandatory. So they have to explore computational environments. <laughs> and they put downstairs. One of the tools we suggest is Scratch, because we have in Portugal, blah, blah, and this, and this, and this. And also Kodu, and also Squeak. So they put several environmental uh, computational. So you are so right, because after that, we have a growing number of teachers that teach ICT. Uh, that are asking us, what is Scratch? I want to do something. And if it is in the curriculum, we open a wide possibility to train teachers and to start working. This is what I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Anybody else want to share overcoming barriers? OK. Well, th this has been really, oh, go on. <laughs> um, I wonder about uh, also working on students' perceptions of computing and computer science. I find that if you're just focusing on something like Scratch or programming, they still don't get the larger picture of how computer science plays a role in the world and how it impacts different disciplines. It's, it's become a very key part of, of science and economics and, and so many other disciplines in higher education computing is, I mean, there's computational economics and game theory and biology and physics, and it's playing a role in all those uh, things. So I feel that curricula also need to speak to computing practices and sort of what uh, she was talking about, exploring computational, uh, computation in other, other domains. And, and I feel curricula need to, need to somehow speak to those as well. So. Thank you, okay. Any other thoughts? I think um, a really nice, have you seen that introductory video on code.org? Yes. I think that's really nice. So you'd be like look, looking for the curriculum that maps to all the kinds of stuff they're covering in there. Right. I think right. it was very. Also, again, that focus on, on just coding. Mm -hmm. you know, 
Yeah, but it's what it's broader than a lot of the videos we have seen. I think up to to now. Okay. I, I think it's uh, about equipping people with the language as well, the the basics, so that you can explore some more of those uh, ideas about information structures and processes in a bit more detail. You know, quite a few of the the, the powerful ideas that underpin computer science. Uh, you know really um, it makes it easier to think about them if you have a sort of a, a basic language in which to, to, to think with. So one of the things that uh, Quinton Cutts, who's the uh, lecturer that I'm working with with the, the professional learning communities, one of the things that he uh, did was um, a series of uh, workshops very much like uh, Computer Science for Fun or CS Unplugged called CS Inside. But what he said was that he probably would have liked the pupils to have some basic idea of computational thinking and what it was, and then actually do the non-computer-based activities afterwards. Because what he found was that some pupils got it. They got that you could take a simple set of rules and it would give you quite a complex behaviour, something like predictive texting. It's actually quite a simple set of rules that if you follow them, you end up with um, you know, commonly used letter frequencies coming up more often. But he found that some pupils just didn't get it. And he thought that part of it is because they really don't understand that uh, computation uh, is deterministic. You know, you have a sequence of instructions, they're followed precisely, and it's not like you get a totally different answer if you do exactly the same thing with the same outputs again. Um, for too many students, I think uh, an awful lot of it is it's magic. It's unicorns and rainbows, uh, <laughs> rather than rather than a simple set of, of processes and ideas that just work very, very quickly, so quickly that you, you can't actually see them in action. I, I completely agree. I also think that this is a big place where, where universities and industry have a big part to play. And, and you know, I, I know that it, you know in sending what volunteers or sending ambassadors out into schools that you know sending people who are young energetic vibrant uh, very excited very passionate about their subject then I'm starting to start challenging some of those image problems uh, and you know uh, and then when you, you you've got that person embedded in a place where that you know there's some real cutting edge exciting things happening whether that's in a, a gaming studio just down the road in Leamington Spa or whether that's in uh, some you know industrial factory or whether that's uh, you know in a in a in a university research environment you know, that, that you can put it in the context of this thing that's happening, I think you also, and I, I just finally want to add to that, you know, those outreach programs, I think, have, don't always just focus on schools and school teachers, they, they need to focus wider, you know, focus wider, um, but they, they need to <laughs> go wider, uh, you, know, the, into, you know, families who, and, you know, parents who make decisions uh, alongside their, pu their children about, about w what happens, I think, you know, and our outreach programs, and I think many in the, the, the UK and, and probably internationally also, you know, they, they look to go that, that bit wider, um, so I think, you know, that's something that I think we can play a big part in. In terms of, um, there's a bit of an issue in having experts in your classroom in the UK, you need a specific kind of what we call a CRB check, which is like a sort of police check to say that you're safe to come in the classroom. Um, and one of the ways that you can get around, get, don't know, get around that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, the one of the ways that you can kind of not go through that kind of process, you have to pay to get one of those as well, is actually using technology. So video conferencing, whichever preference of you want to use, whether it's Google Hangouts or um, Skype, has allowed me to have a professional developer um, from Norway um, Skype into my classroom. I've had um, um, the head of global tech from Reuters, who was in New York, do a hangout to a hack event of 250 kids that I was running. And that just, that kind of, you know, it's 20 minutes out of their day, but it's a massive thing for you as a teacher. I mean, you could say the exact same thing, and it doesn't kind of have the gravitas, as we were talking about earlier. I mean, you could literally, word for word, say what they said, and they still wouldn't go, they'd go, yeah, okay. And like, you know, the same, and they, oh my god, that's amazing. And, and it's just, just, I mean, even if you did it to my classroom, would have the same impact. It's just somebody who's not their typical class teacher. It's usually somebody, in, like the Google engineers, Facebook engineers, Mozilla guys as well, they'll all kind of do a little 20 minute session if you kind of ask them. Um, and it allows you to then have somebody that isn't having to commute four hours just to do 25 minutes in your classroom. So it's a, using technology as a tool, as like what it is, programming is just a tool. 
the same thing. Yes. Thank you, Jackie. That's all right. <laughs> Would you like the last word for me? No. <laughs> no, no. I, I, you, I leave it to you. You start things. <laughs> yes. You initiated the conference. Okay. Well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to the panellists for coming and sharing their thoughts. Thank you guys very yeah. much for sharing your thoughts with us. I mean, I think there's the message that I keep that's come back to me several times over the co course of this is the need to collaborate the value of having people, whether it's working in, in collaborations between industry, different sectors of education, HE, FE, secondary education, elementary education, that collaborations, we're all on the same side of education. We just see people at different ages. If we can work together, um, not quite cradle to grieve, I think that's a bit of the wrong message, but, but if we can work together and work with industry, then you know, the children stand to benefit greatly from this. Plus so, it's fun. Yeah. Plus it's fun, Plus yes. It's fun. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you very much for coming along. Is there any last question or are we done? Do we want to go? The bell's gone. Enjoy the rest <laughs> of the conference. Have a great time, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You,